All right. Well, I'm going to promise another awesome show today because I've got somebody with some great personality, some great experience. He's been around the block and uh, he's got some good stories for us. I've got Mike Waddell with us. He's currently the president of the Allen Americans in the ECHL. Uh, has worked in college athletics, but got to start back in minor league hockey. So welcome to the show, Mike. Appreciate you joining me. Andrew, I appreciate it. It's uh, great to be on with you and uh, uh, fun to spend time talking about sports and uh, the journey because it, it's it's not about where you are. It's about how you got there and where you're going. And it's always fun to, you know, when I talk to people on the show and hear how they've gotten from A to B to C to D because these stories are, are sometimes crazy and just how things work out. And um, so I'm kind of excited to learn more about your journey. So if you wouldn't mind, kind of walk us through, you know, from your, your early days in school all the way up to where you're at now. Well, that's a, it's going to be a, a, a people better uh, sit back and uh, have some patience with this one because it's a uh, weird little group. I will tell you this. Um, I am a, a, a native of Western North Carolina. My dad was a criminal defense attorney and my mom was an educator, uh, both in the classroom and uh, she was the first uh, female school board member elected to our uh, home area school board. So. You know, I've been raised by achievers. I'm an only child. And um, but my mom had me out putting and my dad ran politics uh, uh, in our part of the state as well. And I really mean that. I mean, that's how it was back in the 70s and 60s and such. So, you know, they had me out when I was four years old on the front page of the local newspaper in Newton, North Carolina, handing out, you know, campaign cards for my mom at the Winn-Dixie. Yeah. So and then I was standing on my wagon with a little Carter Mondale thing going back in the day too in 76 when I was six. So, you know, you, you, you learn something. But my first job in sports was uh, I was the uh, head coach and general manager of the Dogwood Hills Hornets, which was my uh, little inner neighborhood uh, football team uh, because I had the backyard. OK, <laughs> if you have the real estate. <laughs> you get to be in charge. So I'm, I'm here. There are people four years older than me, two years older than me, my age and two and three years younger, all on our team. And we put together a little league in our hometown, about 6,000 people, to where like the Dogwood Hills Hornets would pay, uh, play the K Street uh, Trojans. And we do it at the Episcopal Churchyard for the big game, but the practices were in my backyard. How old were I, you when you were doing that? I was six. And, <laughs> and, and, but but the best part about it was we had the World Football League in nearby Charlotte, and they were the Charlotte Hornets before the basketball team was. Okay. They were they were black and gold, but uh, we made our jerseys look like theirs. They were white T-shirts. I had them all in, our, in my closet, and I – made every jersey, designed the logo and everything when I was, you know, five, six years old. So uh, I've always wanted to do this. Um, you know, again, um, I was the guy in the in the neighborhood basketball games or the football games that was always talking. I know that's going to be a real stretch for anybody that knows me to uh, believe that. But always talking. Uh, I was never very good, but did have the chance to play uh, uh, sports in high school, just like everybody. I mean, you, you play whatever's in season. I play football in the fall. I play uh, basketball in the um, wintertime. I tried wrestling, didn't work. I don't really have the temperament of control for that. And then in the uh, the spring, I volleyed between uh, tennis, uh, golf, track and field, and baseball. Uh, you know, wh whatever I could do to, you know, track and field was the best. Because you could take a nap on the mats after you throw. <laughs> I'm not fast, but I throw the shot put, throw the discus, and then, you know, go take a nap and, you know, chill out. Uh, but uh, went to college at Guilford College in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Played football there. Uh, very active student government. Uh, faculty athletic committee as a uh, freshman. Because nobody else wanted to do it. But I did. Because I knew I wanted to be an AD. So right there as a freshman in college. I have the opportunity to be on a faculty committee representing all of the student athletes. And I'm watching the Dean of Students, a lady named Nancy Cable Wells, yell at our AD. And he yelled back at her. The AD's name was Alan Platt. And, you know, I, I'm still in touch with Alan. Talked to Nancy a few years ago. And our SID, who I worked for at the time, Carl McAloos, has been an athletics director. And he's been a conference commissioner. And he has his own search firm now. So it's all about the people you meet along the way. 
And, um, you know, I was blessed to go uh, right out of Guilford to uh, into my broadcasting career at the Tar Heel Sports Network, the University of North Carolina. Um, I thought every year you won a national championship ring. Three years <laughs> as the uh, play-by-play voice of UNC women's soccer, Mia Hamm, Christine Lilly, Tisha Venturini, and the incredible Anson Dorrance Hall of Fame coach. Um, I was also the voice of uh, UNC women's basketball. We won the 1994 national championship with Sylvia Hatchell and point guard named Marion Jones and a uh, little uh, uh, forward uh, named Charlotte Smith who hit a three-pointer at the buzzer to beat Louisiana Tech. Uh, 1993 won the NCAA men's basketball championship. I was the uh, producer of Dean Smith's radio and television shows and I did pregame and postgame on the network. So I got a lot of great experiences there. And then on from being the number three guy at North Carolina, three years later to be the number two guy at Virginia. First year there working with Bruce Arena on the soccer pitch, winning the uh, NCAA championship 1-0 over Indiana, working with Debbie Ryan, a Hall of Fame head coach. All you do is win, man. I I, I, I mean, I was spoiled. (laughs) I was spoiled. You're right. All I do is win, win, win no matter what. But, you know, George Welsh, ACC football championship 1995, and it was great. Uh, Baseball championship at Virginia with uh, then head coach Dennis Womack when we had the grass return field, the AstroTurf infield left over from Scott Stadium, the grass outfield. It was a dump. It was an absolute dump. But, But, you know, I was part of winning. Go to Appalachian State then as the number one guy, voice of the Mountaineers. Uh, my wife Heidi and I, we have uh, two kids. Uh, everything's great in Boone. And then I get the uh, the chance of a lifetime to uh, go to New York and uh, be the voice of West Point uh, Athletics. I was the director of marketing and broadcasting. So I ran the entire network, which is a worldwide radio network, built out <coughs> studio there in Orange County, but uh, signed a radio deal with WABC. Uh, 77 uh, with uh, Tim McCarthy, who was the general manager, and Phil Boyce, who was the program director. So I'd go to, you know, the occasional staff meeting with Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, and Curtis Sliwa of the Guardian Angels. It was wild. But, um, you know, after a a year of doing that at uh, West Point, um, you know, I just, I wanted to do more. Like most media people, I thought I could run the world. So let, let's go and work in uh, intercollegiate athletics as an administrator. And one of the guys that I worked with at uh, the University of Virginia when I was a broadcaster there, he was the associate AD for facilities and operations. And his name was Mike Thomas. And I've worked with Mike now uh, at uh, the University of Akron for five years, then the University of Cincinnati for five years, took a three-year respite from Mike and, uh, well, actually a four-year respite, uh, went three years as the athletics director at Towson University in the FCS. We can talk about that if you'd like. Uh, The difference between being a senior associate AD in the Big East to being an AD in the CAA. And uh, then uh, left there. I had three presidents in 32 months, had a lot of stuff to clean up, but uh, it was time to move on. And I had the really the, the one of the great opportunities to work with a great person in Jeff Long, who's now the AD at Kansas. Uh, he was then at Arkansas and was uh, cleaning up some things. And you'll see this as a recurring theme, Andrew, in my career. Uh, most people uh, like to have nice, steady, easygoing things. I tend to run towards things that are broken. There's a fire. Let's go right for it. (laughs) I I am Mr. Chaos. I I love it. I thrive on it. I am bored if the trains are running on time. I need massive delays. I I could have been an air traffic controller. But I go to Arkansas as the senior associate AD. Um, You know, some people say you left being AD to be a senior associate AD, but it's the SEC. And I can tell you, I've worked at nine schools in intercollegiate athletics and the ACC, the Big East, uh, the Southern Conference, CAA, Patriot League, Conference USA, obviously the Big Ten and the SEC. The SEC just means more. It's not just a slogan. It's just better. Uh, and, and, and I'm a Carolina fan, north, not south, real, not fake. But, <laughs> but I, it, it just means more in the SEC. And so to be a part of Jeff's staff there at Arkansas, to be able to rebuild, Brett Bielema was coming in. We were going through the buildup for the SEC network, and that was really the, the, the impetus for me to join that staff. And I uh, did a big build out with an incredible a group of professionals there to uh, get ready for the SEC network. But then 
Mike Thomas calls me again and says, hey, I'd like you to come and join my staff at Illinois. Um, and, and with all due respect to Mike and the wonderful people with the Illini, it was not a good move for me. And Mike ended up losing his job about uh, 18 months later. And then I'm looking on the outside. And the only reason I went to Illinois was to work with Mike. Uh, I was basically uh, his, um, you know, his oldest kid uh, because he was like a big brother to me. Uh, not really a father, but a big brother to me. And we've been together for a long time, to three years in Virginia, 10 years between Akron and uh, UC. So uh, we knew each other. I think there was a comfort thing, but uh, he was pretty much the, uh, the captain of the Titanic. And we had hit the iceberg about a month before I got there. And we just didn't know it. But uh, go through that. You learn, you live. Yeah. And um, uh, then uh, I had to do some soul searching. First time in my life, I was really at a crossroads. Do I take a great Division II athletics director's job uh, that I was offered? Turn that down uh, on uh, the Monday after the Panthers lost in the Super Bowl. And uh, then I'm waiting around. And um, eventually I decide, yeah, I, I don't want to be in Illinois. And I joined NASCAR for two years. Uh, do the two-year stint with uh, NASCAR in Richmond, Virginia. I was hired by uh, uh, Dennis Bigmeyer, who was, like myself, a graduate of the Ohio University Sport Administration Program. But the driving force to me joining uh, that organization was a guy named Daryl Wolf. Uh, and and Daryl is the, the, the chief revenue guy for NASCAR. I mean, he's an incredible mind, uh, very creative. But he said, Mike, and this will make sense uh, after what I just shared, he said, Mike, I, I want you to come in and be a disruptor. Everybody in NASCAR is basically doing things the same way. And I want somebody to come in and not be uh, shy from some doing bold and new things and, and do it in a different way. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish you my command. And about four months into that, we're down in, uh, we're over in Las Vegas for the uh, 2016 uh, NASCAR banquet. And the uh, guy, Brian Sperber, who was then the president of uh, Phoenix, uh, comes over to me and says, hey, man, just know this. You better hit on every uh, metric that they have for you, because if you are ivory soap, if you only come in at 99 and 44, 100 percent pure, they are going to ride you. And that, it was difficult because, you know, NASCAR and even though I grew up around it in Western North Carolina and my dad had worked with Dale Earnhardt Sr. and some business deals and things it's a tough thing to change and, and they've done a magnificent job and their new schedule was great. But at two years of that was enough. And then I had my dream job. The best job I, I've had to that point was being the uh, president of the Orlando Apollos of the Alliance of American football. Enough said, didn't work out. April 2nd, uh, 2019, uh, we all lost our jobs in the flash of an eye. Um, a lot of people have written about it. I don't need to rehash that, but it was the greatest job I ever had. I loved our players, our front office. I hired everybody there. Our culture was amazing. We documented that on LinkedIn. I got a chance to work with an incredible uh, football mind and our general manager who ran the football ops, and his name is Tim Ruskell, deep career in the NFL and the CFO, and uh, the head ball coach. Steve Spurrier, not the old ball coach. You call him the OBC, he's going to be, you know, PO'd. But if you call him the HBC, he, he brightens up. And that is the most magnificent football coach I have ever been around or, or seen. He is an incredible human. And, and I love Steve Spurrier. But that ended. Uh, then it's, um, it's scramble time. Go to the, um, uh, my own company, Brentwood Partners LLC, with my uh, partner, um, or various partners that I uh, have in, in that regard. And uh, it's been great. And, um, but I miss being on the team side. So had the opportunity to uh, join world team tennis for a while. And uh, with Carlos Silva as the CEO. And he says, uh, you want to do some business development for our team in Orlando? And I said, sure, I'll do business development. Then he sends me a contract and he says, well, can you just be the president of the team? I don't want to be the president of the team. I just want to do your biz dev. I got about 15 other things I'm working on. And uh, he tossed me into it. Um, we uh, worked through uh, December, January, February. At the end of February, my wife and I go out to La Costa for the World Team Tennis All-Star Weekend uh, this past uh, February, March. And uh, come back the week after that. And 
COVID hits and I get the call from uh, Carlos as I'm moving my son who worked for the Saints last year in New Orleans to Clemson. And he says, well, I have to uh, reduce salary, so you're out. I said, well, that was a good 91 days. <laughs> so uh, write me a, you know, he, he was very good. Carl Silva's a great guy. He's a very entrepreneur type guy and uh, wrote me a nice thing on LinkedIn. And um, luckily enough, there was a uh, guardian angel in my life. And, and it's all about people. But there's a guy named Murray Kahn who has. Um, Adam, he was my first guest on the show. Murray, and and if not for Murray, uh, I think he probably pushed me over the line with the AAF. He didn't really know me. I think he just, you know, we, we just dig each other's vibe. And uh, he put me in touch with Jack Galati, uh, who yeah. is the owner of the Allen Americans. And I boomerang into my second ECHL stint March 25th. I get that job, uh, you know, about 19 days after the uh, end of World Team Tennis. So I had probably the shortest COVID uh, layoff period. <laughs> Uh, which is tough when you're trying to, you know, manage things. But we moved to uh, Texas in June and we've rebuilt this organization in the uh, spirit of trying to keep up on the front office side, Andrew, yeah. with the Allen Americans, with the excellence that, uh, you know, our on ice performance has been because little factoid, got to have something you can push. When I go talk to people, I say the Allen Americans of the ECHL, right here in North Texas are the only team in the history of world sport to win four terminal championships in their first decade of existence. We played 10 full seasons. Last year doesn't count. This will be our 12th because we obviously lost it to COVID, but we've won two CHL championships in 13 and 14 and two ECHL championships in 15 and 16. And, you know, there's an excellence that, that is is all about this part of Texas, especially in Allen, high school football, high school wrestling, uh, just the, the industry, the passion of the people. And uh, it's an exciting time to be here with our hockey team. So that's about 17 minutes that you'll get to the answer of that question that you never thought you'd uh, get. And you'll probably wow. never get that time back in your life. No, that's great. That's <laughs> great. But have you anywhere else, have you ever seen a high school football stadium like the one in Allen or McKin? Is it McKinney? Oh, McKinney has yeah. one. They're, they're, they're they just number. built that one. I mean, it's they ridiculous. Have, it's, ours was the biggest. And and, and I went to the uh, season opening game. Uh, Terry Gambles, the head coach here. Steve Williams is the athletics director of the uh, Allen ISD. And I'm telling you, uh, Allen, Allen High School football is the equivalent of the SEC in uh, college football. It just means more. But as impressive as Coach Gamble's football program is, I will tell you, looking at the – and I've seen a lot of wrestling rooms through my day. I, I love, uh, you know, amateur wrestling. And the, the wrestling room at Allen High School, I don't think they've lost a match, a dual meet, in 14 years. Uh, and yeah. they, they travel nationally. They they spend most of their time in Oklahoma and uh, Iowa and Nebraska and such. But it was the most uh, incredibly immaculate wrestling room I've seen at any level, even Iowa and Oklahoma State. I mean, uh, and they have a lot to be proud of. But um, it's a great place to live, and it's a great town to be engaged in sport. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that's that's a hotbed there. Uh, like going back to like your early, early part of your career, you know, how difficult was it, you know, when you kind of made the transition from, you know, more of the communications play by play, you know, broadcasting to, um, you know, that associate AD and uh, working on more business, you know, elements? Well, I, I would say this. Um it was very important. I, I learned very early on, um, and, and this is just in life, to being around achieving uh, people, uh, strong personalities, people who were uh, entrepreneurial spirit, that you're not going to, you can't just do one thing. And and I probably don't have the attention span to just do one thing. I'd probably go out of my mind. So to, to be able to do a variety of things helps. When I was a broadcaster only, that was fun, but I couldn't just be a broadcaster at the Tar Heel Network. Because I worked 39 hours a week for the radio station, WCHL in Chapel Hill, and 39 hours a week for Tart Hill Sports Marketing, which was the uh, the network. Now, it was all owned by the village companies and a guy that is another one of my Mount Rushmore mentors, Jim Hebner, 
who uh, owned the village companies in Chapel Hill and is a master entrepreneur and been on the air himself. But he, he, he taught us all that you have to be uh, multifaceted if you're going to succeed. So I did on-air work. I did graphics work. I wanted to sell. Well, I wasn't going to be able to sell at the level I wanted to sell. So that's why I moved to Virginia. More than the broadcast opportunity going from the three to the two, the number three role to the number two role. I had a director of sports marketing for the Charlottesville Broadcasting Corporation. And I'd never really sold full time before. I started my own company in Chapel Hill to I, I bought the the rights to the North Carolina High School Athletic Association Championship football games, uh, 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A that were played in Chapel Hill. And I syndicated those out. Why? Because I wanted more money. I wasn't making it. You did that on your own or you did that as yeah. part of? Yeah. Nice. I just, I just, I mean, but see, I, I it's, it's kind of like, and that's why, you know, when you look at entrepreneurs in sport, nobody's going to give you an opportunity. If you're not willing to take a chance on yourself and go out and do it, I, I don't I don't know how people go through life like that. And and I am a absolute I hate going to Vegas. I am not gonna gamble with money, but I will gamble with my my kids childhood and my wife's uh, sanity by moving them around like gypsies for this for this thing. And, and, and you know, again, you know, there's the good and the bad. But yeah. but but I just did that. And I had the idea. So I said, Well, how do I do it? I asked some people. A mentor of mine, again, from early on, Rick Strunk, who then worked with the High School Athletic Association, says, well, nobody's doing this. Well, well, I can do that. He said, well, go do it. Okay. Well, I did. So I went out and I sold like 20 grand of sponsorships, hired broadcasters for the four games, and I was the executive producer. But I also got to do play-by-play for the 4A game because I learned he who makes the money makes the decisions. So that, that's where, I mean, then you, you, you learn to sell. If you're an on-air person, everybody knows who you are. Mm -hmm. If you're just a salesperson, nobody wants to talk to you because you're just a salesperson. You're just coming in to get their money. But if you can combine the two, the on-air person and the sales, well, I could get in to see anybody. And, you know, that, that, that's where that kind of took over. And then, and that's good though, because not yeah. not all communications or play by play people can transition to sales. I mean, no, a lot of them do not. We have a dynamic one here in Allen. Our vice president for broadcast communications, Tommy Daniels, uh, he's not a classic sales guy, but he's probably as effective as anybody I've ever been around because he's nice and people like him. <laughs> and, and and they're buying. They're not buying your product. I mean. Really, when I was selling the University of Akron, and I've made this argument when I was interviewing for AD jobs, most presidents and search committees and search firms want a fundraiser to be their uh, their new AD. We need a fundraiser, somebody to come in and bring in the money. And I was saying, well, I've been doing corporate sales at Akron and Cincinnati. And, and they go, well, that's not the same as fundraising. I said, dude, fundraising is getting somebody to give you money. They put their name on the thing. They feel jolly and they get a tax write off. Same thing as a sponsorship. <laughs> if, no, no, no. Sponsorship, I think, is much. If you're at Akron when I was there, oh yeah, the first three years, I'll guarantee you, if you attach your brand to the Akron Zips from 2001 to 2004, you were doing brand damage because <laughs> we were awful. We didn't qualify for. We were terrible in the football field. We were terrible in the classroom. We were terrible in in basketball. We had men's soccer. Men's when soccer did they? Was great. When they build the state, I lived in Canton, Ohio yeah. from 05 to 10. Right. So they they built the stadium, I think, sometime in that. Was that right after you left? Well, we, we I did the business plan for uh, what is called Infocision Stadium in Summa Field. So uh, Gary Taylor was the uh, CEO of Infocision. And uh, at the time, Marty Hauser and Tom Strauss were with Summa. And they were great partners to us at the University of Akron. But we had the vision. We want to get out of the Rubber Bowl, which if nobody really remembers the Rubber Bowl, uh, it was the, the inspiration, I think, for the set of uh, gladiators, what our team said, because it was a WPA project, um, Horseshoe Stadium, that said about 36,000 people. Uh, it was falling apart. Uh, we could do an entire show just on the Rubber Bowl. But... Um, we knew we had to get out of there. So I remember I was actually recovering from a uh, surgery. I gave part of my liver to my dad in a transplant in 2001. And uh, then three years later, I had a uh, complication that came up and was in the hospital for about three weeks. And I was on pain meds. 
And while I was on the pain meds in the hospital, Workaholic here was doing the business plan for what ended up being Imposition Stadium. So if anybody in Northeast Ohio uh, wants to blame me for anything, blame <laughs> me for Imposition Stadium. But it, it's the it medication. The medication did it. It had to happen. It had to happen. You need you needed the morphine trip to be able to do that business plan. I'll guarantee you. Yeah. That's crazy. Tell me like the importance of just relationships, like you know over your career? Because I think a lot of young people, you know, in sports maybe don't realize the impact of, you know, number one is what you do, how it will affect your career uh, in a positive or negative way, but just how important those relationships are. Well, I, I tell you one thing about relationships, and you'll learn this just as a human. Uh, you're going to have uh, ebbs and flows in every relationship you have. And look, I burned my share of bridges, and anybody that says that they haven't burned a bridge in this uh, occupation is uh, not being extremely uh, <laughs> back on their thing because if if you're aggressive you're going to you're going to run over some things and I've been aptly described as a bull in the china shop and at 51 I've, I've tempered a little bit despite the energy that you see here. but but I have and and everybody matures and you look back on things and says wow I could have handled that a little bit better but um I'm very fortunate uh, I've mentioned earlier Andrew my my Mount Rushmore of influence and, um, you know, obviously my parents would, would be great influences, but uh, my, my advisor in college, Herb Appenzeller, who passed away a few years ago, was like a second father to me. He's one of the uh, creators of the uh, curriculum of sport management, uh, along with uh, people at UMass and at uh, Ohio University, where I got my master's. Uh, Dr. A was, um, you know, at Guilford as an athletic director, a Title IX expert, risk management expert, and... Um, you know, a coach. So, you know, he was very important to me. Um, you know, Woody Durham, the voice of the Tar Heels, um, is who I, I'd go to Carolina Picture Day and get my picture made with the play-by-play -play guy because that's who I wanted to be. And then I worked with him and he was hard. Uh, you know, it was a different time. Um, you know, things uh, and the way I was managed there, you know, they worked for me. I'm kind of like Gomer Pyle. The more you, uh, you know, challenge me at a high verbal level, I'm going to perform a little bit more. It's just how I go. Uh, I'm a football guy. But, um, you know, Woody was that way. Mike Thomas at the University of Virginia, he was a facilities guy, and I was the radio guy. And I'd get there early, and I'd mess with his click effects machine and play little jokes on him, go play with his – uh, kids and he, you know, on the weekend when he, you know, just wanted to get some uh, guy time, and that ended up matriculating into my first job in uh, the administrative side. And 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 I've worked with Mike at four places. Like I said, I mean, you know, and Mike and I have had you know ebbs and flows in our relationship too. It's tough when you know you work with somebody and and they get fired, and and I was tied to his wagon. And, and that's been a challenge, but, you know, I'll always respect the opportunities that I was given because, and this is the important thing. The most important thing that I've learned along the way is it's not about really where you work, but it's the work that you're doing. And, you know, I went to Akron. I left a job on WABC in New York at West Point to go to Akron. The AD at Army at the time, a guy named Rick Greenspan, called it Archon and told me I was a fool for leaving there. And, and he didn't want me to leave. You know, I'd just been there about a year, but it was a chance to be an assistant AD. And, and, and I took that chance. But Mike Thomas gave me the opportunity to really screw a lot of stuff up. And he treated me with, uh, you know, respect. I mean, he'd get on me. But, you know, he gave me the, the leash to try some things. And that's what people need to do. Just like when I was with the ECHL uh, 30 years ago. You got to go places where you can screw some things up, spend about two to three years, and then hop. You leave the nest. And, um, you know, the relationships are, are everything. And uh, I collect people. I love the athletes that I worked with in college athletics and the athletes that I've worked with with the Apollos. I still talk about last week, my guy, Elliot Fry, the former South Carolina kicker, gets picked up by uh, the Falcons. Um, you know, on a one week thing when Koo was out and uh, I even picked him up on my fantasy team because that's my guy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I love my people and, um, you know, I'll be hard on them, but I love them and I will defend them to the hill and I will fight for them. And um, man, there's just a lot of stories we could talk about. There were people who have done that for me and I'm just trying to pay it forward. Yeah. Well, how is the transition and the, 
you know, kind of the differences between the collegiate side and then, you know, the pro or minor league side? Because I would think I've, I've only been on the minor league side, um, but I would think there's probably some quite a bit of differences there. 28 years in college sports. Now, in that 28 years, I count uh, three years at the Tar Heel Network and three years uh, at Virginia. So really 22 years on campus, six years with associated groups on the collegiate side. Um, what I found is there's not a lot of respect sometimes between college athletics and pro athletics or pro sports. And what I mean by that is when I was trying to get into pro sports, I was told by the head of a search firm, uh, you're wasting your time because you just worked in college sports and people in the pro ranks don't respect that. So I'm going, well, how am I going to buck this trend? I go work at NASCAR, you know, the most commercialized version of the sport probably anywhere. Uh, you know, I had to get that stream, but I was brought in there to be a disruptor. Uh, so it's a little bit different. Uh, go to the AAF. Uh, it's kind of pro sports. It's kind of pro football. It's kind of fire festival. But you didn't know that at the time. But it still wasn't the same. So, um, you know, everything's a little bit different. Um I, I would say that in, in essence, it's all the same, because if you keep these these basic tenets at the forefront, you're there to serve your fans. And if you keep your fans at the center from the external perspective, as an administrator, always keep your athletes at the center. But it's all relationships. Um, I spent uh, last Friday, I spent maybe four, four and a half hours talking to uh, fans who were concerned over COVID stuff. I give out my personal phone number and, and people like one guy, uh, Rick and Rhonda are two fans that I deal with here in town. I won't give their last name, but you know, I'm talking to Rick on the phone. Rhonda had written me a new one on Facebook. So I, you know, on our page. So I call, call their house. I was hoping to talk to Rhonda. I got to talk to Rick and I talked to Rick for about an hour, told him the truth, shoot straight. You know, it, that's all you can do. You just be honest. He says, well, I get where you're coming from now. I said, well, this is my phone number. You call me anytime. You text me. If you have a problem, tell Rhonda the same thing. He said, I'm not telling Rhonda that because you don't want Rhonda calling you. I said, yeah, I do. I said, no, you don't. But, but, but that's the thing. I mean, you got to be accessible. And, and I can tell you that, that one of my challenges has been sometimes when you go into places and I'm very open, I'm very transparent, I'm out there. I'm going to be out front. Okay. And people will, can, they can misconstrue that. They can say, well, he's just a, he's just an ego guy or he's about that. No, I just care. Mm -hmm. and, and I want to hear from you. If we're screwing something up, tell me, I'd rather have the bad news up front than have people just percolating over here to the side and wondering. Well, and you can't, um, you can't fix it if you don't know about it. That's it. And, 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 and my style is going to be different because I am a broadcaster at heart. I mean, this is fun for me. This is my dessert. I, I love talking to Andrew Haynes, you know, on, on, on a podcast and, you know, 33 minutes in right now, you're saying, damn, I really wish I didn't ask Mike to do this. this is, Hell but, no. But, I mean, I, I, I love it. it because, you know, a lot of what you're saying is kind of, you know, it resonates with me. I mean, it's, you know, it's similar. I've, I've been in independent minor league sports as a, as a team owner, most of my career, I'm 41. So about 20 years almost. And I just had a brief stint, my first job since I was 19, um, which was was interesting. But, you know, there's a lot of similarities there. And I think your approach and the reason why I reached out to you and I wanted to have you on is because I'm just a big proponent of, you know, marketing and um, a spe uh, specifically on LinkedIn with sports teams. And it, it blows my mind how teams don't utilize that tool um to its capacity i mean up in virginia we sold deals off of linkedin and that wasn't even our intended purpose but because we're active because we're putting videos up like i mean i saw you out on the ice i saw you in the mascot like that's the kind of stuff people people love that because it's it's authentic and it's it's ha you're having a good time and people can see that and people want to be part of that yeah and so like your fans that were upset you know, I think probably once you called them, it, it diffuses that because now they're like, okay, they, they do value us. You know? Phyllis wouldn't call me back, though. I had <laughs> one lady named Phyllis, and Phyllis is a retired, uh, you know, government employee, and she won't engage me. So I'm thinking about, um, I'm going to keep calling Phyllis once a week. I'm not going to overdo it. 
Because used to, I would have called her every day. I'm going to do it once a week. But Phyllis, I'm, I'm going to get the Phyllis. And if you're watching this, Phyllis, I'm going to make you like me. I'm, I'm going to try real hard. I think what you got to do is find out where Phyllis works or lives. Oh, I'm a fine. And, and then you know what we're doing? Take the mascot. You yes. get in the mascot. Yes. So I was getting ready and to say. Take the hat off. <laughs> Biscuit the Bulldog is coming to your house, Phyllis. She, <laughs> she, she's, you know, she was one of the ones that said, I've heard this all before. And they always say they're going to do this and they don't do it. And that's why I told my uh, team, I mean, we're going to a COVID year. ECHL is going to start play December 11th with 13 teams. Uh, one team, Atlanta, has said that they're not going to play this year. We have 12 teams that are still evaluating. They'll make a declaration by the end of November and then uh, hopefully join us for 62 of our 72 games in mid-January. But, you know, you know, we've got a we, we've got a, a, a big task in front of us right here and uh, we've got to engage and uh, we've got to be thankful. To our owner, Jack Galati, for taking the risk. I mean, God bless you, Andrew, for being a team owner. I, I've, I've had my eyes really open. Um, I knew a little bit, but I didn't really know. Like, you, you know, but you don't. Right. But uh, I've really seen the inside of this team and, and how some things uh, have been done in the past and how we want to do them moving forward, some good, some bad, and uh, from the past. And, you know, you learn from both. But um, there's an enormous risk that's being taken this year by any owner who is advancing play in the world of COVID. And, um, you know, my, our job is, to, I told everybody the other day, I said, we're going to keep it simple this year. If we say something, we're going to do it and we're going to build. And, yeah. and, and we have to build that trust. And um, I can do all the letters. I can do all the podcasts. I can do all the funny content, TikTok things and dance around and look like the fool. But, um, you know, the time now is that we got to focus on hockey. We've had a nine month off season, 279 days between our last game on March 7th and our next game on December 11th. And uh, that's a long time to bridge without players in the market. And our coach uh, spends a lot of time out of state and the uh, away from our competitive season. So we've had to, there have been a lot of times the old president here has had to go out and do some goofy stuff. But uh, if, you, if you're not willing to get in the mascot costume, you don't deserve to be the president because everybody has to do it. And that's a Bill France. Once. I mean, it's, well, it's, it's fun. A, I've done it everywhere. I've been. I've done it. Yeah. I, it, only Carolina and Virginia have I not been the mascot. Every other place I've been the mascot. And 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 even in uh, the Apollos, we did not have a mascot. It was forbidden from the AAF uh, hierarchy that we have a mascot. But I used to go on the – there's a radio show uh, based in iHeart. Uh, it's an iHeart product there in Orlando called Monsters in the Morning. And I used to go in to see a Russ and uh, the, the group over there, Carlos, and – I got up on Halloween uh, about uh, two years ago, uh, this coming uh, Halloween, and I had the uh, makeup artist from Plant City come over. She airbrushed my face into my favorite musician, Gene Simmons. <laughs> and uh, I, I walked in there with my uh, suit on and my uh, Kiss makeup because Russ is a big Kiss fan too. It's monsters in the morning. We had a good time with it. But if you're not willing to be out front and take the hits, you know you don't deserve to get the, the spoils because – it, it's easy to be forgotten, especially in a market like Dallas. I mean, oh, yeah. look at who, look who's in this market. Who, who's, who, who are the owners in this market? Yeah. I mean, you got Jerry Jones and Mark Cuban. I mean, I, I don't know who owns the Rangers. I don't know who owns the, the, the stars. I mean, I guess I should, but I mean, it's <laughs> kind of hard to get any oxygen with Cuban and, and Jerry out there. And I've, I've interacted with, with Jerry before at Arkansas. He okay. tells you, like, this is a great story about Jerry. He goes, I'm going to tell you, I sat on the front row at a NACTA convention in Orlando uh, near you over at Disney at the Coronado Springs Resort. And he's going to talk about the secret to sales. So Jerry Jones goes on for 25 minutes about the number one key to sales is you got to ask for the money. And he's talking and talking and talking 25, 30 minutes in. Stephen Jones, his son, who also played at Arkansas, is in the back of the room. He says, hey, Dad. Tell him what number two is. I'm going to clean it up for your audience. He says, it'll make a damn what, what number two is. If you can't ask for the money, you're going to starve. 
And I just sat there and I laughed. And I reminded him of that uh, when I worked at Arkansas and we were uh, uh, asking him uh, for money to, to build the academic services building there in Fayetteville. And he's so generous. And the family from uh, Stephen and Charlotte and the, the whole Jones family is so good. And, um, but you got to stand out. If you can't stand it, and, and hopefully that's what people get off of our LinkedIn. I know they did off the uh, Apollo's LinkedIn. We celebrate our employees. Uh, yeah. You build gotta, that culture. I mean, it's it, it, we said yesterday when we we're interviewing people for a job. Uh, one of my people even said, if you're going to work in our organization, you better come to play every day. You better uh, come in with energy. You better be creative. You better have thick skin because we're all I, – I usually hire people that are athletes. Because they can take the, you know, they, they're going to be able to take a little ball busting a little they, bit here and there. They'll be there, and and if it's not, I mean, it's look, we're not we're not running, you know, the Sunnyside Insurance Company in Cedar Rapids. I mean, you know, we're we're running a tough business. I mean, yeah. it's it's kind of like that thing out of Glengarry Glen Ross. If you can't take the abuse in here, um, how are you going to hold up when you're dealing with Phyllis? Man, yeah. Phyllis is tough. Rick's yeah. tough. Rhonda could be like the, the toughest person I've ever dealt with. But, um, you know, you got to know your fans and uh, know your market and work those relationships, brother. It's got to so be. So how, like, you know, you come into a place like Allen, they've, they've been around for a while. I think it's, I think it's a great market, a challenging market because right. of some of those things you had said about how many teams and all, all the entertainment around there, but you're coming into this, there's, there's history there. So how do you go about changing you know, that culture, like, you know, how does that start? And, you know, did you have to come in and clean house? Was it already uh, empty when you got there? It, it wasn't. I mean, uh, one of the things that our owner, Jack Galati, and he's known as the serial entrepreneur, he's had uh, about 44, 45 companies. He's based out of Reading, uh, yeah. Pennsylvania. He's a, uh, he used to a, own the Reading team as well. Yeah, he used to own the Royals. He went to the University of Minnesota, moved here from India when he was a young boy. Wife Rosemary has, uh, you know, sons who run a defense contractor company called Fidelity now. Um, you know, Jack didn't lay off anybody. When we uh, ended our uh, 1920 season, uh, a lot of teams in the ECHL still to this day, they might have one or two employees. We, we yeah. trucked on and uh, didn't lay off anybody. I joined, ran the organization from March 25th on. Um, well, March 25th until June 1st, I ran it from over in, uh, Bristol estates over there in, uh, uh, East Orlando. And, uh, then I moved here in June 1st, got here, saw some things. Um, uh, I had some ideas, but I didn't know. And, um, I, one of my very good friends and somebody you should have on the podcast in the future, Andrew, is a guy named Vic Gregovitz. Uh, he's had a long uh, history in um, Major League Baseball with the Cleveland Indians, Pittsburgh Pirates, Robert Morris graduate, another friend of Murray. Uh, he's currently the uh, president of the uh, Louisville Bats, AAA. Okay. Yeah. And, he was in the uh, AAF too, wasn't he? He was. He was in San okay. Antonio. They, they were the number one uh, revenue grossing team. We were the number two. Okay. Jeff Garner's San Diego uh, team. Uh, he's now with the Orange uh, County Soccer yeah. Club. Yeah. Uh, in the USL, but uh, they were number three. We we're one, two, and three. Vic, myself, and Jeff, and they're both Robert Morris grads. I'm the OU guy. So uh, get that master's degree. But uh, I forgot my point. <laughs> you got me off top. Well, Vic, uh, well, Vic gave me this advice. Uh, Vic said, Mike, just remember this, and this is tough. This is one of those things of going from being like one of the guys to being the boss. Man, that, that was not fun. It was fun being the AD, but it was more fun being the senior associate AD because everybody wanted to come to my party. You go to the AD's party, you go there, you hang out for a while, but you're just biding time. You go to the real party, right? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's a harsh reality when you realize that you're the guy who they're just making the courtesy token appearance at. So, um, you know, one thing that Vic told me was he said, look, you're the guy. And because this is really my first true minor league uh, team president, because world team tennis is very different. And uh, the AAF was single entity with a different ownership structure. So this is it. He says, look, you got one chance. And and right now it's your problem. You know, if it continues on, 
it's going to be the owner's problem and you don't want to be the owner's problem. And uh, he gave me some words and, and there it's an axiom. It's well used, but it's very true. Culture is what you celebrate and what you tolerate. I've been a part of good cultures and bad, uh, and you can learn both, uh, learn things from both. But what I learned from the Apollos uh, needed to happen here. And we did make some changes. Uh, we had to make some changes. First of all, I, I told the owner we need to furlough some people because we weren't selling anything. And if you're not selling anything, money is just going out the door. So yeah. we needed to take a pause and reset. I needed to be able to have some time to kind of clear the board yeah. in best terms and uh, did make some changes. Love the people that we brought in. Um, respect the people that were here before. And and I don't know what all they dealt with and, um, you know, wish them well. But we needed to go in a uh, more uh, focused direction. And we didn't need to be governed by things. I, the, the one thing, again, old axiom, uh, why do you do it? Well, we've always done it this way. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. Uh, the Allen Americans are in the ECHL, uh, middle of the pack in revenue, middle of the pack in tickets, middle of the pack in sponsorships, middle of the pack, middle of the pack. Off the ice, on the ice, we're up here. Uh, yeah, you know that, that that doesn't work. So, um, you know, I challenge people daily. Uh, as soon as I get off this uh, uh, wonderful podcast with you, Andrew, I'm going to be uh, hiring somebody uh, this morning to come in and work in one of our uh, two open positions that we have. And uh, again, I'm going back to that Mount Rushmore, even though I didn't know him. Bill France Jr., the founder of NASCAR, had uh, there was a picture in my office. And, and, and I loved it. It was the, my favorite picture that I had at Richmond Raceway. And it was of uh, Bill France Jr. at Talladega, out front, in his uh, white shirt, black tie, slacks, and his hat, selling tickets. Okay? Everybody sells tickets. Everybody sells sponsorships. Everybody represents the brand. And if you think it doesn't matter, as my uh, friend Kevin Sullivan, the former White House communications director, uh, uh, told me a few weeks ago when we were talking, he said, if you if you think uh, it doesn't matter what you do, go do something crazy because it's going to end up now on Instagram, on Facebook, on Twitter, on TikTok, God forbid. Uh, You know, you're on all the time, so you can't have a day off. And. You know, that, that, that's that's tough for young people to understand when they come into this business. But, um, you know, it's it's a challenge. So how are you guys approaching, you know, this upcoming season, you know, since, you know, COVID? What is your state allowing you guys to do? And, you know, are you guys kind of are you fully staffed up on the sales side and and, you know, roll in there or are you just getting that going? We have, uh, right now, we have two people on our corporate side. Uh, We have two people on our ticket side. We have um, two people on our content side, a finance guy and me. Uh, We will add, um, you know, some marketing slash rev gen uh, people in the uh, next few weeks, probably one more uh, salesperson uh, on the ticket side. Our merchandising person will come back off of uh, furlough, and that'll be our uh, team for the year. Uh, we'll probably go in with about, uh, you know, 12, 13 people, uh, whereas last year we're probably at 18 or 19, um, you know, with only uh, 50% capacity that's uh, allowed through Governor Greg Abbott out of Austin here in the great state of Texas. We will uh, uh, actually be reduced down to 40% because it's 50% capacity, but then you have to put in the social distancing. And that takes us down to 2112, down from 5272. So um, we don't have as many tickets to sell, and I don't need to have that type of uh, ticket staff. I wish I did. Yeah, I don't. And and this is where um, you know the the mantra of keeping it very simple this year, doing what we say we're going to do, uh, being great stewards of Jack's money. It's Jack's money. Yeah, he did tell me something. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur, man, and 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 you know he's seventy eight years old, but he is as sharp as a tack and. He's a great negotiator, but he did tell me something that nobody in my 51 years and nine months has ever told me, Andrew. He told it to me the other day. He said, Mike, you're too conservative. Now, anybody <laughs> that's ever worked with me has never has heard he, that. He's met you before? Talked so, to you? So, I don't... <laughs> he hired me. He pays me. And, and, and so, so, so I said, Jack, if it was my money, I might do this. This is your money. And, and the one thing he told me was, he says, Mike, I need a president for my team in Allen. 
that will tell me the good news, but also the bad news. Yeah. And, and that's, that's tough to do. And, and being able to manage up, I will tell you, uh, I'm going to give a great compliment here to my old uh, boss at um, Akron, Cincinnati and Illinois, Mike Thomas. He might be one of the best people I've ever seen in managing up. He always kept his people uh, very informed that he worked for, whether it be Luis Perenza at uh, the University of Akron, our president, um, um, you know, uh, Dr. Z uh, there at uh, Cincinnati, or even Phyllis Wise at Illinois. Uh, he always did a really good job of keeping people informed, and that's an art. And that's something that I've learned from him. But Jack and I have a call every uh, Monday morning at 8 o'clock. Sometimes it's 30 minutes, sometimes it's two hours. But we talk every week. And if I have an issue, I'm going to call him. If there's bad news, I'm going to tell him. And, um, you know, that's the one thing I ask of my people. And we're getting there. But no surprises. Um, you know, if you want to see my temperature rise, let me get surprised by something. Or tell me we're going to do something and then not do it. Um, you know, that, that doesn't fly. And it, and it shouldn't fly. And that's just part of being an accountable culture. All right. I I love the area you're in. Um any favorite spots to go eat? I've got one I'll share with you. Um, it's a uh, Brazilian steakhouse over by the uh, minor league baseball stadium in Frisco. Golf cuts? No. I okay. can't remember the damn name of it, but it is really good. It's one of the soccer guys from the sidekicks came and played for me, uh, Freddie Mujin, and He's Brazilian, and uh, he's like, hey, you got to check this place out. So last time we were there, we went there, and I love Brazilian steakhouses, and it was it was really good. So I would highly recommend checking it out. It's right by the stadium um, in Frisco. But there's a lot of great spots. Have you guys found anything that you uh, – it's like your go-to there? You know, I'm a barbecue guy. Okay. And um, but, but I also like um, – I, I tend to like restaurants, not only for people, we don't go out a ton, but there's a restaurant here in Allen and it's kind of a, um, it's a private owned, it's not a chain and I really don't like chains, but it's called Two Rows and it's a kind of a brewing company slash, uh, it has a little bit of everything, but the proprietor has uh, become a good friend of mine. It's former Oklahoma baseball player, Bane Brooks, and uh, he's also on the Allen City Council. So I try to take people over there. I had uh, our uh, beneficiaries of our charitable actions this year. One thing that we really believe in with our brand, the Allen Americans, is uh, we have patriotism points in our games. Uh, we sing uh, O Canada and the National Anthem in the pregame. In the first intermission, we sing God Bless America and we say the Pledge of Allegiance. And in the uh, uh, second intermission, we do Sweet Caroline for some reason passing understanding, but we'll, we'll do it. They like it. I thought it was a Red Sox thing, but whatever. I, I like Neil Diamond. I would have chosen America. But then uh, we come out with uh, Lee Greenwood. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's something like that. But I like going down there because he makes me a salad. Uh, and, and not that salad is like the end all be all. But he makes me this salad and he let me name it. It's, um, it's <laughs> shredded lettuce tossed in some uh, ranch dressing and then he puts some grilled chicken with some buffalo sauce on it has very few calories and since he's a sooner and it's a weight loss salad i say you need to call this the uh, uh slummer sooner salad and so you'll <laughs> name it because i like to brand um <laughs> it's a fun thing like that but uh i'm all for finding places uh hutchins barbecue is pretty good uh like big daddy's uh here in town um orlando uh, since you lived here give me uh, I'm a yellow big dog barbecue. Cat Yellow Dog Cafe in Gotha. It finally came to me a few minutes ago where I was uh, telling you before we started taping. But uh, Yellow Dog Cafe in Gotha is. Oh, the, yeah. That's like right by like Winter uh, Winter Garden. It, yeah. Windermere. Yeah. Yellow Dog Cafe is. Yeah, yeah. The We've eaten there. We get the blue suede shoes in Cincinnati. Now, let, let me expand now. Cincinnati, Montgomery and Barbecue, the black and chicken salad is the hidden gem on that menu. Now, you can get the uh, black cherry uh, chocolate chip ice cream from Grater's, or you can go Skyline Chili. But I, in Montgomery Inn has great barbecue. The ribs are great, but they're a little wet for me. Jeff Ruby Steakhouse, also really good. Get the Chris Collinsworth steak. If I'm in Baltimore, uh, Ocean Pride Seafood right there on York Road, 
absolutely outstanding. Ricky and Randy Bielski, they're as entertaining as the food. And I love me some sausage uh, crab. A pit beef? You like pit beef from Baltimore? I, I, I do. I was getting to that. That was the next thing. Now, <laughs> it has a sports tent to it, too. Up in Lutherville, Timonia, up on the right side as you're going up York Road. See, Towson's over here. Then yeah. way up here, as you're going north, there's a place called Andy Nelson's Barbecue. Andy Nelson was a member of the Baltimore Colts back in the day. Okay. Yeah. He played at UAB, Unitas era, you know, that type of a guy. Andy Nelson's is, is now I'm a North Carolina guy. I'm a barbecue center guy yeah. from Lexington, you know, but Andy Nelson's pretty good. You know, my, my wife is from Baltimore. So, yeah, no, Ooh, Ocean yeah. Pride, Andy Nelson's, you got to do that. Um, in, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, Timeout Chicken and Biscuits and the Sunrise Biscuit Kitchen in Charlottesville, Virginia, a gas station. It's called the Bel Air <laughs> Market. Uh, this is how poor I was in uh, Charlottesville. I was so poor. Former uh, a Top Gun pilot and uh, Virginia quarterback. He was my uh, co-host on some shows on Cavalier Football Game Day. Uh, the late Gene Arnett. He actually dated Farrah Fawcett. This guy was one of my <laughs> But uh, Gene knew I didn't get paid, Dink. I think I got paid eight grand to do, uh, and I want to talk about this before we leave, about my advice to people getting into business. But uh, I made eight grand as an on-air guy. I made a $24,000 draw off of, uh, off of sales, which meant that if my commissions every week didn't equal up to what they were paying me, I owed them money. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, don't, these, these cats are going out with the, uh, and I, I, I admire it. It's, it's good intention. The Fair Labor Standards Act. I wish I had that. I might actually these have These kids have no clue how good they got no it. <laughs> I have no clue. But, but, but Gene Arnett knew I didn't have any money. He gave me a card for, he worked, he was the head of Tiger Fuel in Charlottesville. And they had this little, uh, deli inside of an old Exxon gas station. It's, you know, Charlottesville, a little upper crust. So it's not like I was eating at a gas station. <laughs> not like I'm eating pickles, pig's feet, and, you know, wieners off the roller, but, but they had all these really nice, uh, uh, deli sandwiches and all that. He gave me five grand a year on there. I ate more sandwiches in that golf and that gas station than can be. But dude, I, I whipped anorexia a long time ago. Uh, I am a healthy boy. And uh, love to eat. And uh, thanks for that question. That was a fun one. You got me yeah. hungry now. Uh, I know. I'm like, damn, I got to figure out where I'm going to have uh, lunch today. I could go for some barbecue. So, you could do so, it. so give us that advice, though, for okay. people starting out. So a few years ago, um, you know, I, I started to, I guess I had gotten to a point in my career where people would invite me to come talk to their classes. So I've been uh, blessed to talk to classes at Ohio U where I went, Guilford College where I went, Northwestern University, every, every school I've worked at. I, I taught three classes at the University of Cincinnati. But um, a few years ago, I started doing this one because I find that a lot of people say they want to work in sports. And I've even had this experience, uh, you know, uh, in some of the recent jobs I've had where people who are coming in from outside of the sports world want to work in sports because they're a fan. And, and that's the worst thing you could do because, you know, everybody has a degree now. I forbid my child, my, uh, my oldest, uh, who graduated from Murray State. He was the head basketball manager there, um, you know, with John Morant, a few MVC, I mean, OVC titles. But I forbid him from getting any degree that had sports in it as an undergraduate because I wanted him to have a solid base. He got a, a business degree. But because my frustration is so many people have these sports undergraduate degrees and they have no experience because they haven't worked unpaid internships. If you don't work on an unpaid internship, I don't feel like you're really getting an understanding of what's there. You're too worried about what you're making instead of what you're learning. Yeah. So I asked, uh, I was at the uh, University of South Carolina. Matt Brown uh, runs uh, the USC program. He's the dean there and uh, sport management graduate program and undergraduate competition they were having. And I had like 500 people in the room. So I'm standing up there. And uh, it was when I was with the Apollos in the AF. So I got everybody to stand up. I said, hey, y'all been sitting here for like four hours. I'm the four o'clock speaker. Need a little energy at four o'clock. So we got it going. And so I said, everybody stand up. So 500 people stand up. Now over on the side, I've got um, uh, Danny Morrison that used to be the uh, AD at Wofford and TCU and 
Um, he was the president of the Carolina Panthers. I've got Sporty Geralds, who's a Guilford grad, but uh, is a professor now at South Carolina. Used to run the Charlotte Coliseum. I got some people, man. I got some big time people, people I respect. I get 500 people stand up and I said, okay, everybody uh, jump down, uh, turn around, put your hands up in the air, get, get loose. Okay, now sit down. If you've not worked an unpaid internship for at least six months, out of 500 people, Andrew, 250 sit down. Unpaid internship? What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm a sport Isn't management that against the law? <laughs> I'm a sport management student. I'm deserve to get paid. Okay, whatever. So 250 people sit down, 50% of the crowd. Okay, now, now we come to the real uh, cuts. Like NFL, I'm the Turk. So I say, now, sit down. If you're not, and be honest, sit down if you're not willing to go anywhere in the continental United States or Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands, Marshall Islands. If you're not willing to go anywhere and commit to being there for at least two years. I mean, it could be Oshkosh, Wisconsin, Agunquit, Maine, Las Cruces, New Mexico, Nagatis, Louisiana. If you're not willing to go there, sit down. 200 people sit down. <laughs> I'm not going to Nagatis, Louisiana. A gun quit me? No. Okay. I'm left with 50 people. So now, you people have told me that you've done an internship that's unpaid, and you're willing to go anywhere. So that's good. But now. Are you willing to go anywhere? Are you willing to go to Nome, Alaska, Sacramento, California, Reno, Nevada, or, you know, Wilson, North Carolina, and work for $500 a week, $2,000 a month, $24,000 a year, and no benefits for two years? I'm left with three people now standing up in the room. <laughs> and I said, and Matt had me uh, uh, scheduled to talk here for the next 57 minutes. I'm not going to waste your time because I'm taking these three people. We're going over to uh, Starbucks. I'm paying. And I'm going to tell them the real truth about what it's like to work in this profession. And after that's done, I might have two. Might have two people that really know what it takes to last year because the burnout rate in sports is over the top. And if you're not, if, if you can do anything else, if you can do anything else, do it. If you don't have that passion that just drives you, I go to bed at night and I get up in the morning thinking of this stuff. You don't want to know what I dream about <laughs> because it's nothing It's nothing of the fun nature I'm assuring you. I'm dreaming about ticket I, sales, ticket sales, yeah, ticket sales, <laughs> select a seat process. What are my point system going to look like? I mean, I, I and I, I'm not making that up. No, I mean, I, because you can't, me, I know, but, but I, it, the people don't have a clue about what it is. And when, like, recently I had an employee that joined me, uh, they had come from the agency setting, they were highly recommended, but they, they, they joined the, the organization because they liked the sport. And, and I'm going, and I'm watching, and then something changed. And, and finally, after about 45 days, I brought them in. I said, look, we're at this point in this evolution, and we're about to go to this point. When we go to this point, it's going to speed up. We're, we're, at, we're at idle right now. We're getting <laughs> right. ready to go to – we're getting ready to get in the Falcon 9. And yeah, this is up. nothing right now. No, and, and I said, this isn't going to work. And, and they agreed. And most times, if you communicate with people, and this is, again, it's relationships, it's communications. If you're open and honest with people and they know where they are, you know, they usually come to the conclusion on, on their own. But that's why it's so important to find the right people, to build the right culture, to, um, you know, to, to make that kind of stuff work. And, and, and I, that's the one piece of advice I give to people, you know, Andrew, is that make sure that you really are going into something for the right reason. Don't do it because mom or dad want you to do it. Look, my grandfather owned a bank. My uh, dad was a criminal defense attorney who's one, who had his own law firm. And his one living dream was that I would go to law school at the University of Mississippi, where I was already uh, accepted, was going to gray, gray shirt football play under Billy Brewer. And I was going to go to the uh, Ole Miss. I was going to meet somebody in the Tri-Delts. I was going to, you know, go to law school there at Ole Miss. And I was going to come back. I was going to practice with him for 10 years. And then I was going to run for judge or governor. 
I mean, that's what he wanted me to do. He planned out my life. I don't want to do that. I want to do what I want to do. Yeah. I want to go. I want to go talk about Tar Heels, Dad. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? I he had a class ring from Carolina, and he has his law school diploma from Chapel Hill. But I got five national championship rings, and I got better seats. I got to work with Dean Smith, Mac Brown, Anson Dorrance, Sylvia Hatchell. You know, I mean, Michael. I mean, uh, um, Michael Jordan's dad and James Worthy's dad used to watch games with me in my studio because it was the only place they could smoke. <laughs> Urban Worthy and James Jordan were a gas. Where I couldn't have gotten that if I was, you know, if I was like. You know, bouncing clowns in district court in Catawba County, North Carolina. I've been miserable, but uh, this is fun, man. This is great. And I appreciate your time, and yeah. uh, you know, I'm so excited for you and your new journey. And this podcast is awesome. And um, you know, anything anybody can ever do, just reach out to me. I'm on Twitter. I'm at Wadsport W A D S P O R T, okay. and um, it's Mike at AllenAmericans.com. Yeah, Mike, I sent you an email of uh, um, someone from Free Agent Fridays that, that was on that's out of work. Great. It's some great experience. Um, but, yeah, anytime you're looking for somebody, check out that website. It's got – we're up to – I've done 97 interviews over the last roughly three months. That's three and a half months. God bless you, brother, because I can tell you, and you know this too, through what you've gone through. When when we got the call, actually, we didn't get a call from our HR at the AAF on April 2nd, 2019 at 11.42 in the morning. Uh, I think I got a, a tweet uh, from somebody that said that the AAF was ceasing operations. And then that started a cavalcade of calls on the football side. We didn't hear from the uh, business operations side of the uh, AAF uh, where we got an email from the board. Uh, but I didn't hear from my boss for another five days, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, but then 24 people were out of work and it's a tough time right now. It really yeah. is. But, um, the one thing you got to do, and, and this is for all the people who are the bosses out there, you know, I was really blessed. I want to toot some horns here for a second. Uh, with the Orlando Apollos, I had Bobby Bridges as my VP for sponsor, uh, tickets. I had Amy Wise as my VP for sponsorships. I had Mike Harris as my VP for marketing. And these were three of the most amazing people that combined along with my director of operations on the office side, Mary Eubanks, and on the uh, football side, Thad Rivers, who's now on Lane Kiffin's staff at Ole Miss. Uh, we worked together and we found everybody a job in our operation within six weeks. That's all. Uh, they all made good decisions. I didn't make some of the best decisions after that. I took uh, one or two uh, contracts on that looking back. <laughs> On it, that's kind of crazy, but uh, man, keep the faith. If you're out there, if you're if you're struggling right now, if you need something, listen to what Andrew's uh, uh, preaching on these uh, interviews, and and reach out to people, and make those connections on LinkedIn. And you never know. I mean, uh, it's gotten to the point now where if I don't know somebody through somebody I trust, like Andrew or something like that, it's hard to get in because um, you get burned a few times. And, and right now it's, it's a critical, there's a lot of people out there for jobs, but you got to find the right fit. So, uh, make sure you look for the fit and God bless everybody during this time. Yeah, no. Well, thanks again, Mike, for joining me. Let's definitely keep in touch, man. Love the, uh, energy. Glad we were able to finally, uh, connect. It was awesome. And, uh, you're a blessing. And, uh, again, uh, continue good luck and good health.